Despite the supposed fame of this big fella, its true history and research in paleontology is kind of a nothing burger with a side of Schrodinger's tailbone. Anyways, the first fossils, composed of only tailbones, were allegedly found some 200 years ago, close to when the very first dinosaur, Megalosaurus, was described and named. Except with Titanosaurus, they didn't actually know it was a dinosaur until way later. Largely because the person who found it, Army Officer William Sleeman, wasn't a paleontologist and kind of found fossils by chance rather than intention. These ones in particular were located in present-day Jabalpur, a city on the banks of India's Narmada River. From there, they were sent to and fro several people to figure out just what they were. Sleeman first gave a few to a surgeon who was with him when the fossils were first discovered, with more being transferred to an antiquarian, then back to Sleeman, then to the Geological Survey of India, and finally settled in the Indian Museum. Geologists and paleontologists there determined they belonged to a reptile, with the name Titanosaurus being created in 1877 by Richard Ledecker, referencing the Titans from Greek mythology. Later on, a handful of other fossils were found in India that were attributed to Titanosaurus, including an entire femur and some more vertebrae, but those ended up falling through, being given to other similar sauropods. In the meantime, the holotype, due to unregulated museum collections at the time, went missing. Or so we thought. In 2012, more than a century after it was archived, the holotype vertebra was uncovered in the dusty collections of the Geological Survey of India, thanks to two paleontologists whose names I won't try to pronounce out of respect and self-preservation. This left us with the one and only tangible piece of Titanosaurus we have now. A single bone. That's not much. Most scientists think so too. Since it's not unique compared to other titanosaurs and so fragmentary that we can't confidently place it in an existing group or confirm it as its own species, this makes titanosaurus a nomen dubium, which means, for all intents and purposes, it doesn't exist. Since its discovery, Titanosaurus also ended up becoming a wastebasket taxon for a lot of similar sauropods, aptly called Titanosaurs, which we now know to be their own separate thing. Isosaurus, Perpetosaurus, Janosaurus, and Megairosaurus were all once considered to be Titanosaurus. Usually I'd talk about how big the animal is and what it looked like right about now, but that's a little hard to do when the animal exists more as an idea rather than a true group of once living, breathing organisms. So instead, I'm changing the format a bit to talk about a different Titanosaurus, the one that appears in the trailer for Jurassic World Rebirth. For this episode, I'll discuss the design choices made in the film and my personal interpretation of them. Let's get started. First off, I do want to acknowledge that the design team actually did a really good job with making the Titanosaurus look different from other sauropods in the franchise. Brachiosaurus, which we see for the first time in the iconic scene in the first Jurassic Park film, is in the same clad as Titanosaurus, so their body plans are pretty similar. Yet instead of just getting a Brachiosaurus ripoff, this new dino has distinct Titanosaur qualities. Its body is super bulky and barrel shaped, with a strong neck and giant pillar-like legs. The original Brachiosaurus is a bit shrink-wrapped and skinny, while this Titanosaurus is clearly meant to be well-fed and thick, with a capital T and two Cs. If we look at the head compared to other well-known Titanosaurs, we also get some interesting comparisons. Skull material, especially from sauropods, is extremely rare, but from the limited material we do have, the Jurassic World design isn't far off. If we illustrated the skull, assuming the dome shape on its head is soft tissue rather than bone, we get something like this. Paired against real titanosaur material, like this well-preserved skull from Sarmientosaurus, you could easily believe it was a real animal. The fleshy dome only adds to the accuracy, since a lot of scientists think titanosaurs covered the concave parts of the skull with soft tissue. Now onto the weird and wacky parts. First is the tail which is a complete 180 to the common titanosaur. Instead of the comparatively short and rigid tails we'd expect, the ones here are longer than any sauropod ever. The ends of them are so light that they literally float in the air, 
they've also got some beautiful striped coloration going on. All of this to say, whatever caused this to happen likely wasn't from the original titanosaur DNA sample. This will make sense in a bit, but let's move on. One of the easiest deviations to notice from typical sauropod traits is the addition of a whole new structure, fins. Now, elongated spines aren't unheard of in similar dinosaurs. We know for a fact that Amargosaurus had soft tissue connecting their long and unusual neck spines, but it was probably a lot thicker and not so bat wing adjacent as we see in Rebirth's Titanosaurus. Amargosaurus is also not part of the Titanosaur family whatsoever, which begs the question, why? This is where the film's plot comes in to save the day. In the trailer, it's mentioned, These dinosaurs were too dangerous for the original park. Worst of the worst, we're left here. So it's safe to say that this is basically the island of misfit dinosaurs. The bad batches, if you will. My guess, as of now, is that these guys were made when InGen was only just starting to figure out dinosaur recreation. More specifically, what animal to replace the gene sequence gaps with? Check this out. We used the complete DNA of a frog to fill in the holes and complete the code. <clears throat> and now we can make a baby dinosaur. But what if they didn't use frogs to begin with? What if they tried lizards, for example? We know the West African frog's ability to change sex slipped through in the original park's velociraptors. So maybe, just maybe, the crest, fin, and long striped tail of a basilisk lizard managed to make their way into Titanosaurus, with their wispy long tails liable to hit the electric fences and trigger aggression, they were left behind. That's my headcanon at least, until the film hits theaters. As for other Titanosaurus featuring media, there's a few others out there, the most notable being in Prehistoric Park, though they're referred to as simply Titanosaurus here, not Titanosaurus in particular. It's also under the abbreviated name of Titano in Fossil Fighters, a dinosaur game similar to Pokemon. You could also kinda consider Titanosaurus from the Godzilla franchise as an example, though it's not based on the real animal by much. Though the fins share a striking resemblance to those in Jurassic World Rebirth, could be a slight nod to Godzilla by the director. Very cheeky, Gareth Edwards. And thus marks the last episode of Prehistoric Animal of the Month. I know this might be a shock, but it's time I let this series go. Don't worry, I'll still make videos like this every now and then, probably once every few months, and your past, present, and future suggestions will still be taken into account. I just can't keep up with making these every single month anymore. Not only has it been hard to do on top of classes, work, and just life in general, but it's prevented me from making content aside from this format. I want to start making bigger and more creative things, like the Spinosaurus sound design video I posted a few weeks ago. I've got some really fun things planned, but I need time to figure out how to make them a reality. And if all goes to plan, Things are going to get seriously exciting, sooner rather than later. Love y'all, and as always, keep your pencils sharp. <laughs>